Hello and welcome to Best Practices, uh, Flood Walls and Closures. This is a combination of chapters E8 and H5 uh, for the January 2021 Best Practices class. And my name is Terry Sullivan. I'm with the Risk Management Center. Uh, we're going to cover the flood walls portion chapter first, um, chapter E8, give you the background, talk about T walls and I walls, and we'll focus mostly on I walls although there are more T walls in the inventory than I walls, but we will focus on them because of the failures that occurred to the I walls in Hurricane Katrina in 2005. Um, we'll talk about load considerations, event trees, key points. So local protection projects do utilize embankment levees and flood walls, and flood walls are generally used when the space was limited um, and real estate couldn't be obtained. Uh, and what that really means is they're in urban areas. So flood walls tend to be used when, um, when there's not enough space um, to, to build larger embankment systems. Um, and there's a wide variety of flood walls available. And the types are, T walls are the most prevalent type and they're named T walls for the obvious reason. And we all design T walls for retaining walls in classes and as undergraduates in engineering school. And there's horizontal, flat, and keyed base T walls with and without sheet pile cutoffs. There's also uh, uh, deep foundation pile supported T walls. Uh, Southeast Louisiana's got thousands of them. There's L walls. Uh, again, all these walls look the same at the surface. Uh, you can only see that there's a wall, cantilevered wall sticking out of the ground. Um, and then there's uh, the basic eye wall. That's a sheet pile uh, driven into the ground and then in cast in place concrete cantilevered portion above. There's also buttress walls. There's some examples of this in New Orleans, Cincinnati, Ohio, Monroe, Louisiana, uh, Richmond, Virginia. These tend to be very tall walls and those buttresses collect the loads and uh, provide additional resistance. Uh, so it's not just a cantilever. And there's also mass concrete uh, gravity walls. Uh, those are used in places where there's shallow rock and it doesn't uh, make economic sense to uh, excavate for a T wall or drive a pile for an I wall. And then uh, far less often there have been uh, flood walls built with uh, cellular sheet pile wall configurations. There's a couple in the uh, Lakes and Rivers Division, uh, Newport, Kentucky and Williamson, West Virginia. So T walls, um, usually uh, the horizontal base is most common, the slope base less common. Uh, the sheet pile cutoff for under seepage control, um, generally not for stability, but can be considered in your uh, risk evaluation uh, to contribute to stability if need be. Uh, shear key for sliding stability, uh, many have shear keys, many do not, and pile founded or no file, pile founded. Uh, Generally, these perform very well in flood loading to the full height, uh, with a few minor exceptions. Uh, minor probably isn't the right word, with a few exceptions. And just terminology quickly, uh, the land side, the wet side, the stem, you see the sloping base uh, wall on the left and has a sheet pile cut off in this case. The flat base uh, T wall on the right has a keyway for uh, sliding resistance. Um, and neither of these cross sections show the, um, the tow drain, but the tow drain uh, collects uh, groundwater and lowers the uh, groundwater table on the land side, reducing the uplift force. So under seepage considerations, um, to really understand under seepage, uh, you really need to read best practices, D6 internal erosion risks, um, and that can be understood in conjunction to help you do a better job understanding the under seepage issues with the flood wall. So the primary types of seepage under control measures for T walls are sheet pile cutoffs and uh, landside tow drain. Less often the riverside impervious blanket or landside seepage berm. The seepage berm generally being added when uh, a, a, a large flood has is, is occurred and there's been too much seepage water or even uh, sand boils on the land side. So it would be a remedial action taken afterwards, generally not in the original design. And uh, keep in mind the sheet pile uh, walls don't completely cut off seepage, but the interlocks are generally tight enough that uh, solid materials uh, don't pass through in any kind of a large amount. 
So uh, it's a good line of defense for, for global failure. Um, and the important considerations include the condition of that under seepage control system. And in that case, I'm really talking about those those tow drains. Those tow drains are often uh, vitrified clay pipe or plastic. Um, and these perforated pipes um, are generally not video inspected by sponsors. Um, and a lot of them are crushed over time, especially the vitrified clay pipes. So we've, we've seen many, many, many miles of those that have been crushed over time. So they're not really effective if they're crushed. So if your uh, floodwaters um, impose uplift forces on a T wall and the tow drain system isn't working, it may not be able to perform as it was designed. In those failure modes for T walls, there's global instability, sliding, overturning, and bearing. And I think sliding is probably um, probably the failure mode for T walls you would mostly be concerned about. Um, the structural performance um, of the, the cantilever T section, uh, the shear capacity and the moment capacity need to be evaluated and in, uh, internal erosion um, as well in conjunction with um, riverine erosion. So eye walls, uh, so generally eye walls were really intended to be used only when the uh, cantilever height was low under 10 feet, uh, but there are many exceptions to that in some cases much taller than 10 feet. And uh, they're less expensive to build than T walls, so no base slab, no real foundation element other than driving sheet piles into the ground. Um, and they've been used in both flat natural ground and in uh, embankments. And uh, a lot of the eye walls that failed uh, in, were embankments in New Orleans, um, soft embankments built by cast soils. Um, the type two eye wall, the middle of the five shown there on the lower left, is the most prevalent type. That's a, uh, the type that was used uh, almost exclusively in New Orleans and in many places around the country. So this slide's important, um, contains information that should grab your attention. So eye walls, they represent less than a percent of our levee miles, but about 10% of the levee systems have them um, in the country. And they're almost always located in those urban areas as we discussed before. And all the levee systems in the, um, in the uh, federal uh, inventory, about 3 million people live and work behind levee systems with eye walls, and there's about $600 billion in property value behind those same eye walls. So that's about a third of the overall population, about half of the property value. Uh, so eye walls are important. And the fact that they're bad actors uh, is the reason why we give them so much attention. And the final point is that virtually every uh, semi-quantitative risk assessment that's been done to date with uh, for, for levee systems um, has included the failure of an eye wall as a risk driver. So what are those failure modes? We'll talk about uh, the failure modes. There's two failures here from Katrina. The one on the left is the 17th Street Canal breach, and the one on the right is the Citrus Back Levee eye wall, which is far less well known. And of course, multiple eye wall failures during Hurricane Katrina. Um, much analysis, much um, study, many PhDs based on what happened in Katrina. Um, a huge self-examination by the Corps of Engineers as a result of what happened in Katrina, primarily the eye walls. And uh, the failures in New Orleans were really mainly caused by two overarching issues. One was overtopping. The overtopping of the walls tended to result with a scour jet moving across the top of the walls, uh, scouring material on the land side, uh, which started to uh, remove the material that gave passive resistance to keep the wall stable. So these walls tended to perform just fine as long as they were uh, till they were fully loaded and they started to fail when they were over, when they were over top. So they lacked resiliency, but they were they were designed uh, well otherwise. So then the formation of the flood side gap is the second point, and those were walls that failed prior to being fully loaded, um, such as 17th Street Canal and the London Avenue Canal. Uh, the flood side gap occurred because the soft materials on the land side um, compressed and the wall moved laterally towards the land side and full hydrostatic head reached the bottom of the sheet piling, causing the flood wall to fail. So what 
if you're doing um, a, some sort of a risk assessment for a levy that has an eye wall, you really need to become familiar with the Interagency Performance Evaluation Task Force Report, or IPET report, uh, written over a number of years after Katrina by a, by a collection of organizations that included the Corps of Engineers, but also academia, uh, non-governmental organizations. Um, it had a series of findings, but the key findings were those overtopping extensive erosion and scour that led to failures. Um, there was significant scour and erosion at transitions between flood walls and levees that caused failures there as well. We're not going to spend a lot of time talking about that, but it's something that needs to be understood. And the eye walls with the flood side gap was the other one. Uh, T walls, they tended to perform well in Katrina with that one exception we'll talk about in a minute. But uh, overtopping did not lead to extensive scour and erosion and uh, the, the T-walls in New Orleans tended to be pile founded anyway. So not only did the scour not reach a great depth because of the base of the T-wall, they were they had deep foundation elements so they tended to uh, reach stability. So um, in the notes on this slide you'll see a, a link to take you to where uh, the IPET report can be found. And then the, after Katrina, the Corps of Engineers did a, a massive self-examination, uh, as I spoke of before, and part of that was a data collection on how many other eyewalls do we have? What condition are they? Could this happen again? Congress wanted to know the answer to all those questions. So they performed a phase one and phase two eyewall evaluation study. Every district that was asked to go out and look at your levy systems, tell us if you have any eye walls and then describe the eye walls. That was phase one. And then phase two, let's look at the worst of those eye walls, the, the tallest ones, um, and let's do some analysis on those eye walls, some basic screening level analysis, global stability, uh, seepage, uh, global stability, and um, uh, other damage issues. So that was done and those reports are generally available at every district. So the current eye wall guidance, um, is really contained in engineering technical letter uh, 575 ETL 575 and that's uh, evaluation of eye walls. It was written after Katrina in I believe 2011. It was rescinded because the sunset date happened and then um, and then again it reissued to continue use um, because in current the current plan is for a rewrite of engineering manual 2502 which is covers levees and retaining structures, hydraulic restraint, re retaining structures, but contains all flood walls and hydraulic retaining structures. Um, we'll incorporate all the information from ETL 575, as well as all the other information that was in the old 2502 and updates to that. And in developing ETL, uh, excuse me, in developing engineering manual 2502, um, the authors of that publication wanted to improve the, the documents um, guidance on an understanding of the connection between the sheet piling and the concrete and cantilevered eye walls. And when they did that analysis and started doing a study, they discovered that there's another potential failure mode and that's a brutal fra failure at the sheet pile to concrete interface. Um, so that that's going to be in the new EM 2502, and we're starting to uh, examine all uh, eye walls for this problem as well. So it's an insufficient connection between the concrete on the riverside and the land side of the uh, cantilevered portion of the wall uh, below the top of the sheet piling. Uh, can form a crack, and you can have a brittle fa failure with no warning. So water levels for evaluation, uh, it's not really always straightforward for levees or flood walls because you have to consider that there could be a incipient overtopping location at a lower elevation somewhere else in the levee system. Um, when that occurs, uh, the flood wall may still eventually undergo full loading, but there would then be floodwaters already in some portions of the consequences area and under that scenario, the incremental consequences of a breach of the flood wall would not be the same as if there was no water already there. So the consequences could be reduced. Um, so that needs to be understood by the team doing the risk assessment. 
And when you're looking at uh, loading on flood walls, what to evaluate, you really need to look at all the different a variety of different loads because the frequency of the loading could change radically from 25 to 50 to 75 to fully loaded of exposed height. Um, so if that frequency is, is uh, if it's a very infrequent flood, you may find uh, that the um, annual chance, uh, the annual probability of failure of the, of the flood wall is, is very low just because it's infrequently loaded. And then other water forces to consider, uh, wind and wave, and that's storm surge, wave impact, and overwash. And uh, the exposed fetch needs to be long enough to generate waves. So obviously coastal areas, there's no limit to the fetch. You can get very large waves, very powerful waves. Inland uh, flood walls, the story is different. You need to have an understanding of how high those waves can actually get. There may not be a chance for them to, enough fetch to develop a significant wave height. So. The Corps' uh, shore protection manual is the, the Bible for developing those wave loads. And then barge impact considerations. Uh, there's a new draft EM 3402. It's now in draft state. It's being reviewed now. Um, and it considers a lot of the lessons learned from Katrina. Over 200 barges broke loose from moorings during Katrina. There were impacts and damage to the flood wall in numerous cases. Um, the HISTORS guidelines, the Hurricane and Storm Damage Risk Reduction System guidelines do include design considerations for barge impact for uh, coastal flood walls. Um, and it should be considered for inland levees where there's uh, commercial navigation traffic. So we provide a couple example of event trees for global failures of T-walls, uh, a couple things to consider. So you may consider the contribution of sheet pile cutoff to global stability. You don't have to, but you, if you need it, you, you may do that. Um, flood walls with complex alignments in urban areas, there's a few things to consider. I'll show a slide on that in a second. Um, and then for internal erosion beneath, underneath a flood wall, the event tree can look very much like an internal erosion uh, for, for a levee, uh, earth and embankment levee with a few changes. So the notes will guide you through that. So here's some 3D effects for agent monoliths, adjacent monoliths. So this is a urban levee system uh, with a, uh, three right angles in a short uh, stretch. And so the, the flood wall monoliths are in the highlighted areas. They're constrained from moving towards the land side by the adjacent T walls. Um, so if those walls um, can't move uh, in their the T walls adjacent to them are stable, then there's not a possibility of them, those moving. Although this is probably not a likely scenario to look like to look at in a risk assessment, the, the methodology is the, the point. Uh, understanding that there are 3D effects, uh, especially in urban areas, uh, it's very important. And then global failure of a T wall. Here's an example from uh, near Kansas City in 2017. This is a non-federal. T wall, the lower of the two walls on the upper left photo is the non federal levee. And below that non federal levee, there were some very large uh, erosion uh, features, uh, almost look like caves below that wall, above that uh, wing wall there. Um, so apparently the water was stacking up uh, on beneath, behind that wall on the land side. Uh, maybe coming through the railroad ballast from that hillside above, and there was an erodible foundation. And as the material eroded, it started to move the material above the uh, wing wall, then the wing wall, which was in terrible condition. Uh, there was a local failure of the wing wall, and that started to move material. And then the entire uh, wood pile found a T wall failed. And then there was a global failure of T walls at Sunrise Pump Station, Hurricane Katrina in 2005. The story is not well known. Uh, we're trying to get the word out on it, but in, it was also in August 2005, and uh, about 180 to 200 feet of uh, T wall failed. This is pile founded T wall, and most of that T wall was never found. Um, it formed a scour hole so large, 180 feet wide, 500 feet long, and up to 30 feet deep. Um, that the, the T walls uh, completely disappeared, uh, including the, the piles were apparently sheared off or torn out with the walls. Um, 
So uh, water water was coming across from the land side to the river side, in this case, down in Plaquemines Parish. And here's an example of an entry for a structural failure of T wall. So that's generally the, the cantilevered stem portion of the T wall. And an event tree for eye walls. And of course, um, um, the node two is really critical because if the wall is overtopped and the answer is yes, then you can get a failure because the passive wedge erodes. And if the answer is no, you can uh, get a failure for um, because you could get a flood side gap forming. So um, study those. And then system response curve development. Uh, flood walls, we, we have developed some good analytical tools to do uh, analysis of flood walls, uh, both T walls and I walls. Um, and it could be a key input as part of that elicitation process. So the team doing estimating the, the uh, likelihood of failure has should have good tools available. Um, and you really only look, need to look at the dominant failure mode in the end. You don't want to double dip. You don't want to um, assign uh, extra uh, failure, likelihood of failure of a wall because it has a possibility to fail by, by two different modes. You just you need to pick the most dominant failure mode and take that. And here's a simple example of a system response curve for a flood wall. In many uh, flood walls, T walls, that uh, that probability of breach is close to zero till the water gets very very close to the top. Uh, in this one, they they've broken it down a little bit more. Uh, but it, it generally, uh, this generally shows it's still got a, uh, it's a very low probability of breach till the water's all the way to the top. So those key flood, way, flood wall takeaways because of the T wall and I wall emphasis, um, they lend themselves to a good risk-based approach. And there's good information on I walls um, to use, a lot of detailed references that can help you out and you should utilize those. So now we'll go on to closures, um, chapter H5. Not all closures look like this one, this big beast in uh, Richmond, Virginia. It's a rolling gate that has a, it's big enough that it has to have a truss on the rolling gate itself. We'll cover the purpose of levee closure systems. Um, my emphasis here is that it's primarily an operational risk and can all closures get properly installed in time. But we also have to consider the condition of the embedded components we want to talk about the different kinds of closure systems and the risk factors, show you an example of event tree and follow up with key takeaways. So what's the purpose of uh, levy closure systems? Well, simply put, they're uh, close, they close off uh, damming surfaces and openings for the levees. Um, during non-flooding, these there's nothing there but an open passageway for a roadway, a railroad, or personnel to, to pass through. Um, or water to pass through because the majority of closures are for culverts, uh, uh, storm drainage culvert systems. Um, and almost every levy system has multiple different kinds of closures and closure, closure devices. Um, and they all need to be understood when you're doing a risk assessment. And each time, each type has its own risk factor. So here's a, a variety of those different kinds of levy closure systems. The movable gates, uh, that's a that's a, a pendant uh, rolling gate on the top left in West Virginia. Culverts, many different kinds. That's a flap gate. Sandbag closures, stop log closures, soil piles, soil baskets. Those are HESCO barriers. And then uh, the classic post and panel. And also uh, pump stations. They all have gravity flow outlets associated with them. During a flood, those gravity flow outlets need to be closed off. This is a particularly large gravity flow outlet for a creek. Um, and bulkheads are placed to close that off during a flood. And other types of levee closure systems, uh, demountable closure. This is Evansville, Indiana. It's over 1,500 feet long. Takes a crew of knowledgeable craftsmen multiple days to install it. So keep in mind that that means other crews are forced to do closures on other areas because this closure is so large. So this has literally thousands of components, but it's uh, it's uh, almost a Swiss watch and it's, uh, you know, uh, craftsmanship the way it was built. And there's more and more of these uh, being constructed in different cities now. 
Another type of closure system is the flood break closure. They are raised automatically. It's a passive system. Um, and there's only one in the uh, use ACE inventory to date. That's in Indianapolis, Indiana. So I don't believe that contract's even been completed yet. The example on the right is Lourdes Hospital in Binghamton, New York. They have 11 of the flood break closures in them. They were installed, I think, in 2010. And then 2011, they got a heck of a test. They got like a 500 year flood and uh, I think the closures did a great job and kept their parking garages and their lower levels dry so it's something to research and understand. Potential problems with a stop log and post and panel. Um, keep in mind closures, levy systems, they're different than the government owned and operated dams. They're maintained by local sponsors. They're traversed daily, sometimes thousands of times a day by truck and automobile and rail traffic and maintenance of all that, um, uh, all these closures um, can in many cases uh, fall on arrears. So there can be damaged concrete sill in the abutments. Uh, those, uh, they, they can be paved over. Um, and when they, they're paved over, the asphalt needs to be removed during a flood so you can get to the closure sills. And that means that the, those closure components can be damaged by the milling equipment that removes the pavement. That's the photo on the lower left shows that. The lower middle shows removal of asphalt to do a trial installation. Um, and sometimes they have missing cover plates, which can lead to a constant submergence of uh, steel components, which can lead to corrosion. And then railroad closures, we could do a whole presentation just on railroad closures, but uh, railroad trackage uh, can be raised over time and the railroad places more ballast and more ballast under the rails, raising them over the top of the uh, concrete sill. And so that means the local sponsor won't get the opportunity to do a trial installation across the railroad because the railroad would be um, highly resistant to taking their track out of service and removing rails to do that. So that's something to keep in mind. Alteration of sills, that top middle photo shows a strange alteration by a railroad to a sill at a railroad closure that uh, resulted in an opening uh, just above the rails uh, at the location where the hydrostatic pressure of course is the greatest and then finally uh, reluctance or even a refusal by railroads to shut down their tracks in a timely manner during actual flood events so um, Hawesville, kentucky in 2011 that's what these photos are water actually moving through the uh, closure opening um, as when the railroad finally decided to come in and uh, allow the government to put in the closure. So the key risk factors for stop logs and post and panels, uh, is there an approved plan? Um, is this document that you're looking at here, this typical movable closure plan, does it match the components that are in the vaults? Are the personnel who work for the community are they trained in putting these installations in? Do they know how to read the drawings? Do they know where the parts are? Um, is there a good connection between an understanding of how to install the closure and the crews that are available? And then the storage is the, are those vaults secure? Um, they're not always secure. Sometimes they're vandalized and theft. Um, the theft is not that uncommon because uh, the salvage value for uh, steel and special aluminum uh, is is worth the risk to uh, to some thieves. Um, and then you have to keep the parts inventoried and they have to be done frequently. Um, movable gates, so probably the highest risk factor for movable gates is did they remember to get it put in, in, put in on time? Um, you know, these are the highest level of reliability. They're the, they have the greatest ease of installation and they require the least amount of time to install. And sandbag closures are just the opposite. They take the most time to install. Um, they, they're they not engineered. They're generally uh, placed by volunteer crews or National Guard or the local football team or even a jail. Uh, I've been on all of those, all crews like that from different flood events that I've been a part of. Where are the bags stored? How will they be obtained? Who's filling them? Did they tie them correctly? Did they fill them up too much? They're gonna leak. You better have pumps ready. Uh, soil pile, soil baskets, uh, HESCO barrier on the left. So um, the foundation is the key here. Uh, there have been noted failures for HESCO barriers uh, just in two 2019 in Davenport and Burlington, Iowa. Um, 
predicted a series of pretty considerable test series in 2005 after Katrina. On the left, that's testing that was done on a HESCO and uh, two other systems in Vicksburg. That's along the Mississippi River. And then on the right, that's at Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania, on the Allegheny River. That's the Port of Dam. Different kinds of culvert closures, flap gates and sluice gates are the most common. The others are less common. Uh, vertical slide gates are also very common. Um, this is the highest number of closures in the inventory by far. Uh, the key risk factors is because culverts carry water and their, their gravity discharges. So that means that they're the lowest part of the levee and elevation, which means um, they're the most, uh, they're the soonest part of the levee to uh, be submerged. So um, if the local sponsor is not rapid in checking um, the gravity closures, uh, they can get closed around debris and then not seal. So that's really the problem. And then once that problem is discovered, the, the toe of the levee on the riverside is underwater and it's difficult to deal with. So. And then miscellaneous issues. This is a case where a, a homeowner is on the wrong side of the levee, but decided to build a security fence around the flood wall, which he considers his own private property. And so it makes access by the sponsor difficult. Here's an event tree for post and panel. Uh, this is an example where multiple nodes um, involve human responses. And there's no node on this particular event tree where a properly installed closure failures fails, but that can obviously be added for a, a closures with damage embedded components. So that's the big question. Can all the closures be installed in time? And I think it's a it's the most important question. Uh, the, the municipalities that turn this over to one of the agencies in their municipality and they have other responsibilities. And when a flood event occurs, that modest staff that works for that agency has a lot of extra responsibilities they have to take care of. And it's not just putting in closures, they're operating pump stations and they're checking all those gravity pipes for debris. Um, so in one of the SQRAs that was performed about a year and a half ago, a Gantt chart was uh, built for all the active closures on an urban levee system. And they found even with a crew of 40 people, it would be very difficult to get all the closures installed. That was used as a communication tool to talk to the local sponsor. And the potential challenges to a timely installation, like we said, too many closures, not enough crews. The river could rise at a higher rate than it usually does. You might have to repair some problems to the damaged uh, abutments or sill. Um, you may have to remove that asphalt overlay over the sill anchorages, or you may need to remove uh, railroad ballast ties and rails to get to the sill under railroad closure. And remember, it's brutal physical work if the right equipment isn't available. If you have 10 closures in a community and only four crews, um, and all the closures have to go in at the same time, then you're bringing in people to do work they're not used to doing, and they're doing really difficult physical uh, labor. And then poor weather conditions can make that work harder and slower. So estimating the risk for a closure system what really starts with what is the annual chance of exceedance for the water reaching the sill? And if it's uh, an infrequent load, that may point to a low likelihood of failure, a low annual uh, failure probability, just because the infrequency of water even getting to that closure. So you may choose a different closure that gets loaded much more frequently that may be more robust. Um, so, of course, the ability to success, successfully set the closure prior to the flood of arriving is really the biggest risk that it should be, it should get a bulk of your attention. So the key takeaways, there's a lot of different closure systems and they all have their own risk factors. Um, the timing of the flood arrival and the ability to set the closures, that's critical. We have a historical database of levy performance and although there are instances where closures malfunction, um, that may not be a function of the type of closure. It just may be a function of the sponsor or local entity's understanding of their system. Culvert gate closures, they're probably more frequently problems than others, but may not have the consequences. And closures can be as well, closure analysis can be as well suited to the kind of tools we have available.